Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here today. So uh, I'll start with a little bit of uh, my background. So I'm more or less a career soft aviator. I came into uh, AFSOC as a uh, first lieutenant and uh, have more or less been in uh, AFSOC for my entire career with a, a few brief exceptions. Uh, I started that career at RAF Mildenhall, uh, served some time uh, flying at MH-53s there as well as at uh, Herbert Field, Florida prior to uh, going up to uh, the Joint Special Operations Command in uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, where I served as the uh, aide-de-camp prior to going to, uh, off to uh, IDE, follow on to uh, headquarters U.S. SOCOM, uh, and back to Herbert Field, where I commanded the 6th Special Operations Squadron, uh, one of my current units that works for me doing aviation for and internal defense. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, after uh, my command, uh, I went up to the uh, air staff for my one and uh, only uh, respite from SOF, where I spent 10 months on the air staff working in A5, uh, something I'm very proud of. I think I did a total of 10 months in the uh, Pentagon, which is uh, almost unheard of. Uh, following that, I uh, returned back to uh, Fort Bragg, uh, where my family uh, remained. I went to Afghanistan for a year and commanded uh, one of the air expeditionary uh, advisory groups there before uh, coming back to Fort Bragg uh, as a uh, commander of the uh, air uh, unit there. Uh, I recently took over, well, not recently anymore, about two years ago, took over my current role at the uh, Special Operations Air Warfare Center, which, as you heard, is really three different groups. Uh, one is uh, combat development, so doing all the research and development and operational test of aircraft on a soft platforms that are out there. So one very technical piece of our portfolio. Uh, the second piece is that irregular warfare piece, uh, which I talked about uh, doing aviation for and internal defense. So these are airmen that are uh, trained to fly in various different foreign airplanes. We send them off to uh, uh, different countries to teach them how to employ air tactics and presumably get them to do some of the things that we would like for them to do in our strategic interests. And then the final portion of my portfolio is training and education, and really that's the reason that I'm here. Training and education uh, also includes leadership development. Uh, the training and education we do is, is mostly centered around air crew training. We do about almost 80% of all the mission qualification training in uh, AFSOC. Uh, but we also have a schoolhouse function through the uh, uh, special operations uh, school there at Hurlburt, as well as a uh, combined language center with uh, De uh, Defense Language Institute. So we've built in a, kind of a, a leadership thread to that. And usually when I give this uh, talk, it's to, uh, to a more senior level. So I'm going to kind of go a little bit off my script, but so if you, you won't uh, uh, mind, I'll, I'll look at my notes a little bit just to make sure I don't skip anything of importance. Because what I want to talk about is, uh, is something that's become important to me and something important to, uh, to our command, and that is how do we develop leaders in a conscientious, uh, conscientious manner? So we define that as, or we define ourselves as air commandos. You know, and that's what I want to talk about today is, you know, what is an air commando and, and how do we go about uh, developing them, um, like I said, deliberately? Uh, but before we talk about that, I, I thought that I would maybe talk a little bit about SOF in general, and uh, hopefully this will set up some uh, questions and discussion for later on, but maybe dispel some of the myths that exist out there. And uh, probably when a lot of people think about SOF, they you know, conjure up in their mind these hulking figures with a chest full of metals, a penetrating stare, and loud voices. And what I would tell you is that if my command chief uh, Chief Master Sergeant uh, Cal Markham had come with me. That's exactly what you'd have gotten. Uh, if, you, if you get the chance later on, uh, Google uh, Will Markham, and uh, there are some, uh, some uh, videos out there of some of the exploits that uh, he went through in the early days of the War on Terror. He's a combat controller by trade. Uh, really stuff that is uh, hair-raising and would make you proud. But uh, unfortunately, he had another engagement come up at the last moment and couldn't make it out here. Uh, but that's kind of the, the, what you generally think about. Uh, you, you might also think about you know, our joint partners, which we uh, spend a lot of time with, whether it's the Army, the Navy, uh, or the Marine Corps. 
And they all have their own kind of stereotypes that they deal with, which are, I would say, more or less untrue to a large degree. Uh, but at the end of the day, what I would tell you about soft airmen and air commandos is that we are airmen. We are airmen just like everyone who sits in here, just like everyone else in our Air Force. We come from the same places that airmen come from. We are assessed the same way. We have the same frustrations. We have the same joys. We have the same trials that every airman goes through. But what we might have that maybe is not all that unique is that special ethos, that idea of being an air commando that really drives what it is that we are. So when I first pulled up to the uh, Special Operations Air Warfare Center, there's a wall right outside of my headquarters building. And on it says, turning airmen into air commandos. I thought, OK, well, I, I was certainly familiar with the term air commando. But how do we define that? There was also a, uh, some 13 attributes of an air commando. 13 attributes. Can anybody remember the Ten Commandments, all of them? It's hard to remember all ten. Probably mo most people come up with about five, and then it starts to get a little bit fuzzy. So 13 is a tough number to, to remember. So I started asking around to people within the organization, both students and the permanent uh, party, uh, as well as my peers, other wing commanders, saying, hey, what, what does it mean to be an air commando? I talked to former AFSOC commanders. I talked to a former chief of staff of the Air Force, General Schwartz. Hey, what, what does this mean to us? And everybody could talk about it. Everybody said stuff that made sense. Nobody was wrong, but it was hardly standardized. It was kind of all over the place. So I thought that this was going to be a challenge worth uh, tackling for me. If my organization had seized this as its motto, we're going to turn airmen into air commandos, we better be pretty sure what an air commando is. So we set out to work on that. And it took a, a, a month or so, but what we came up with are five core values of an air commando that complement our own Air Force core values. And those are the ones that I want to talk to you about today. The first one is commitment. It's a commitment to our mission, and it's a commitment to one another. The second one is maturity. And that's the maturity to do things right and to do the right thing. And there's a difference between those two. The next is expertise. We have to be excellent at what we do. And that has to be something that comes from each individual that comes into SAW. The fourth one, maybe the most important, is creativity. We've got to find a way to yes, just every time. We've got to be creative. And then the final one, and I would argue this applies to any organization, is trust. We have got to trust our airmen to do the things that we need them to do. But more importantly, I would argue, is we have to instill trust in them that we are going to look after them. So that sets the foundation for what it is that we want to do to turn airmen into air commandos. So we've kind of defined the end state, but what about getting there? How do we, how do we take people who come into SOF and make them those air commandos? So the idea of an air commando, it goes really way back, uh, a long history of it in SOF. Uh, back to the days when American airmen were resupplying the chindits, in, uh, the British chindits in Burma. It goes on to the Doolittle Raiders. And that ethos developed about getting the mission done every time. The, uh, along those, um, as, as we developed that, uh, that culture, some groups developed within AFSOC. And I would tell you that as all group dynamics, some grew in ways that were relatively uncontrolled and developed some habits that maybe uh, we weren't so proud of. Uh, there were some people who maybe took a certain loose uh, view of rules, regulations, and uh, in some cases, uh, standards. But I'll tell you that all these things led to an environment where leadership development, if not done completely differently, it certainly was not done in a standardized manner. When I arrived as a first lieutenant at RAF Mildenhall, I was the first uh, lieutenant to show up there for, for many, many years. And I arrived at a unit that was 
relatively experienced. And uh, I would say pretty typical of, uh, of many experienced units in terms of the professionalism that was exhibited there. And what I mean by that is that there was kind of a bell curve. You know, there were, there were people that did things right, and there were people that sometimes didn't do things so right. By fate, I fell in kind of on the right side of the bell curve with some captains and NCOs who really had high standards, who really insisted on doing things the right way. And my career has uh, been all the better for it. it. I could have very easily fallen into another group uh, on the other side of the bell curve there. And perhaps my career would have had a, a different trajectory. But it didn't. So I was uh, very fortunate. But it highlighted the fact to me that you know, this, was, uh, this was not going to be implemented for me. So the need for a change in how we develop our airmen into air commandos, you know, it's more than just stems from doing things right, although that's compelling in its own right. I mean, I think we, we also have to think about uh, how we look at the last 15 years of SOF. And I'll tell you that things have changed uh, since 9-11 for SOF. Pre-9-11, SOF was, I think, seen and acted in a way where you were we were very secretive. We uh, tended to sequester ourselves. We were behind a wall. Uh, we waited for somebody to ring the bell. Off we would scurry from wherever we were, go out and do whatever it was that we do, come back to home station, slam the doors, and then we'd peer over the walls and occasionally talk to people when we felt like it was necessary. Not a good way to build a team. I would tell you that the Afghanistan and the Iraq experience uh, has opened up SOF. We've uh, made a realization that we are very much dependent on the other general purpose forces out there. And I would argue that everybody benefits from that. So we need to continue that. That coupled with the fact of it's a relatively smaller force now with relatively more demand out there mandates that we start to bring up people in a way, in a conscientious way, that they are prepared to leverage the full uh, spectrum of air power throughout the soft battlefield and even other battlefields. So our model for, uh, for leadership, going back to our, uh, our uh, ethos, you know, the, the commitment, maturity, the uh, experience, the creativity, and the trust. That's, that's where we start from. Um, when I think about professional development versus leadership development, you know, I, I, I kind of uh, have a problem with that. I think that they're more or less the same thing. Maybe professional development is for a large group. Maybe leadership development is for a somewhat smaller group. But they're more or less the same things, except for the ways in which we talk about them. Because when we talk about professional development, and uh, for the, the cadets in here, you may not be uh, very familiar with the OPR and EPR rating system now, but I presume that you have something similar to that here in the academy. But when we talk about articulating how well people do, we tend to do so in terms that are very tangible. We tend to talk about things like flight hours and dollars saved or even enemy killed in determining who it is that percolates up in rank. But those aren't the real things that we value. Are they? I mean, what I tell my squadron commanders is, is we got to look for the qualities that we admire in people, the character that we see in people, and promote those things, give those people the opportunities to make those tangible efforts in order to percolate up in the system. So things like integrity and excellence and service, commitment, maturity, creativity. Humility, humanity, those are the things that people follow. Not how many dollars you save, not how many flight hours you fly, but those are the things that we tend to pay attention to. So we have to kind of try to uh, change that dynamic. So we're approaching that in a couple of uh, definitive ways at uh, AFSOC. The first of which is establishing the culture of a lifetime of learning. So we do this uh, through a program that's backed up by the headquarters and uh, really administered at the wing level 
but it's executed uh, through my special operations school. And what it is, is it's kind of based on the, uh, the rated air crew development timeline. In other words, somebody comes in, they learn to be a co-pilot, they eventually become an aircraft commander, then an instructor pilot, et cetera. And at each one of those levels, they're given more and more education, not just about their craft, but about the command at large and about leadership. But it's not just for our rated air crew, it's for all of our sessions that come into uh, AFSOC. So it, it, that at certain phases of their career, they're exposed to this leadership develop, development in a very conscientious way. So at the Special Operations School, it starts out uh, with some very basic courses. They teach a total of about uh, 18 or 20 different courses there. And everybody gets exposed to the introduction to special operations. They get interagency for soft. They get dynamics of international terrorism, kind of baseline fundamentals. After that, you ratchet it up. We have uh, the uh, multicultural courses. Uh, we have uh, theater engagement courses. We have courses where we bring foreign partners in uh, and share their leadership philosophies with our uh, airmen. And then kind of as you get on the, uh, the more expert end of it, you have uh, contemporary in insurgency warfare. You have cross-cultural communications. You have aviation FID, really learning the craft. And these are all great things that we need to know as soft professionals. But I tell you, it's just the jumping off point for identity-based education, where we really can model those values that are so important to us. So that's really the, the, the first way that we've uh, tackled this. The, uh, the second way, and this kind of goes back to my experience when I showed up at uh, REF Mildenhall, we realized in talking to my peers, uh, talking to a lot of people in the community, that you know, there's a really long period of time between when an officer gets to go to SOS, their uh, initial developmental education, or, or their, is it primary developmental education, PDE, and their intermediate developmental education, ACSE. And in between that period, which happens for SOS, it's the uh, first couple of years as a captain, for ACSE, your first couple of years as a major, there's about 10 years where you're expected to be an expert in your field. And that's what we, we really uh, put on them to do. Uh, really develop into an expert. And they rise up into the ranks, and before we know it, we're sending them off to ACSC, spin them off to a staff somewhere, and then they cycle right back into our units, not having been deliberately developed as leaders to take over in the leadership roles at the squadron level. So that was a problem for us. So what we decided to do was develop a captain's course to identify those high potential officers that we felt like were going to be commanders in the future and put them through a course for a week with their peers where they get to learn about not only leadership but kind of some practical lessons about command. How does the, how does the command operate? They're very busy flying aircraft and doing the tactical mission. But how is it that a squadron commander is able to, to manipulate his finances? What are the tools that the, that the JAG brings that uh, they can use? What, are the, the, what is the staff doing for them? How does the staff interact with higher headquarters, both the Air Force and with SOCOM? But again, to give a jumping off point for this idea of identity-based education, to hammer home all those points about that commitment that we expect, about the maturity necessary to lead a unit. So we've had great success with that. We've had it uh, for about three iterations now. And uh, what we realized after the second iteration is that, wow, you know, this really applies to more than just these uh, senior captains. Let's open it up to some junior majors as well. So we grew a little bit. And after the next iteration, we decided, you know what? Senior NCOs are a part of this too. You know, let's, let's, let's bring the senior NCOs into it. So we grew it a little bit more. And we just realized that, you know what? We're missing the civilian component as well. So we've created two more courses for the senior NCOs specifically, as well as uh, the civilians, to get that same level of leadership training throughout their careers in AFSOC, so that when they do matriculate to the point where they are in control, where they are in leadership positions, they have all those tools. They know what it means to be an air commando. So it's, uh, it's been a, a huge success for us, but I'll tell you that those are, are really just kind of the tangible ways 
in which uh, we, we've done this. And uh, the most important thing, at least in my mind, is what you get to do when you have those people together, but arguably what we should be doing every day of the week, and that is modeling the behavior that we wish to see. The reality is, is that you, know, you can talk to people all you want about core values and about how they should act and what they should believe, but until they see it in practice, they're not likely to pick it up. That's what leadership is about. It's about modeling the behavior you want to see, and it's about mentoring the people that you want to succeed you when, when they take over. And it, and it happens uh, more rapidly than uh, many of us uh, would, would care to admit, frankly. You know, being an air commando is more than about slapping a black patch on your uniform and getting to work. And I think for a long time that that's the culture that had developed within AFSOC and arguably within the soft community at large, that I was special because I wore a black patch. And that's not what it's about at all. That's the ticket to entry. You have to be committed. And we have to model that commitment. Because if we're not committed to our mission and we're not committed to our people, how can we ask our airmen to be committed? If we're not mature in our decisions, then why should they be? If we're not experts in our field, they're not going to take the time to be experts in theirs. If we're not creative in how we address problems, can we really expect them to be creative as well? And if we don't trust them, how in the world do we expect them to trust us? You know, the future that we get is the one that we're modeling right now. And to the degree that we fail to be proper models for the people that follow us, we jeopardize the future of the Air Force and we jeopardize the future of Air Commandos. So that's our focus at the Air Warfare Center. Uh, that's about uh, all I wanted to open up with. And what I'd like to do now is just open it up to uh, questions you might have either about the leadership development philosophy we have there, or uh, I found out actually uh, last night that this was supposed to be an, uh, or a uh, soft panel. Well, I'm the panel, so uh, I, I don't have uh, my wingman with me, but I saw uh, Colonel Holland just walked in, who's a, a great man and one of my early mentors as a uh, stick buddy uh, flying the MH-53. So uh, if you stump me, then I'm sure that uh, Colonel Holland can jump in and uh, bail me out. So what can I answer for you? I see some scurrying. Sir, uh, Cadet First Class Tuma from CS16. So I have a question. You talked about how we should look at people who have the qualities we want in a good leader. So things like humility and things like that. And those are the kinds of things that are supposed to count for your OPR. However, the OPR board looks at quantitative things instead. So a, hum uh, a humble person won't go bragging all their things, all their accomplishments, all the numbers and quantitative things they have accomplished in their life. But how how will you give them that opportunity to succeed and to be promoted because they actually are the type of leader you want to have in your Air Force? How, how is the... Do you how do you square that corner? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's the problem, right? So uh, first I would tell you, thank you for your question. Please sit down. Um, the, uh, the, 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 don't get humility confused with, you know, being able to uh, do the things necessary to be done. I mean, just, be, just because you're humble doesn't mean that you're not out there doing those things. It, it very well means that you're not out there singing your own praises and, uh, and looking for a, a pat on the back necessarily. But we can facilitate those uh, individuals to do the things that they need to do. We can put them in positions that they need to be in in order to garner those kinds of opportunities to do the things. They're not going to be the ones who, uh, who tell you about it. That's fine. That's our job as leaders, to recognize what they're doing. I mean, that's what supervisors are for within, uh, within units. They need to capture that, and they need to 
uh, reward those people who genuinely do have the character to lead and who can do those things that we need them to do. Yes. Afternoon, sir. I'm a C2C Kyle Spratt from CS23. I was wondering if you would mind sharing any badass stories as a Special Forces air aviator for us, particularly. <laughs> Uh, stories, stories as a as an aviator, particularly one that incorporates your five principles. So uh, I, I anticipated this question. Um, in the in the stock answer is, well, I can't tell you anything. Of course, that's nonsense. Um, so there, there's uh, you know any any number of uh, occasions where uh, you know we've we've had to look at um, all these different qualities to get the mission done. And uh, one that uh, comes to mind for me uh, personally was uh, in the early days of uh, OEF, uh, we were uh, based out of Pakistan, Jacobabad, Pakistan. And we were flying across the border. This is in uh, November of uh, 2001. And we were uh, infiltrating uh, some people. The, the Taliban were all over the south. The goal was to push the Taliban out of uh, Kandahar and then start working our way up the, uh, the Kandahar Valley. So we were uh, infiltrating uh, people and vehicles uh, south of uh, Kandahar. I happened to have a mission where I had a uh, full-up uh, Suburban in the back of my MH-53. Now, MH-53 is a big helicopter, but a Suburban is a big truck. And there was about, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say about two inches on either side uh, to get that on. Uh, furthermore, the MH-53 flies at a max gross weight of 50,000 pounds. We happen to be at 53,000 pounds, uh, and most of this was uh, aft center of gravity. So this is one of those uh, uh, places where, okay, by the books, we can't, we can't do this. You know, how, how are we going to get creative? Well, as you've likely heard, if you haven't, you will hear, you know, there's a waiver for everything. Uh, and so we, we propose it that way. Hey, you know, you, you want us to do this, but we're going to be severely aft uh, CG, uh, and, and we're going to be overweight to make it happen. So, uh, so we were able to, uh, to get that done. We ended up uh, uh, infiltrating uh, the people. One of our helicopters actually uh, broke on the ground uh, at the time, and uh, this is in the uh, black of night uh, there on the sands uh, south of uh, Kandahar. And uh, it, it was kind of nerve-wracking, but, uh, but we were able to, uh, to pull it out. So that's, that's one example. Um, there, there's uh, a lot of other uh, circumstances um, that, that I, I, I do hesitate to talk about, not because uh, I, I don't want to share it with you, but uh, I'm, I'm afraid that it might be beyond classification uh, for, for here. So I apologize for that. Um, but it's called on every day, you know, and, and I, I, like I said, I wish uh, Command uh, uh, Chief uh, Markham were here uh, to tell his stories because he's, uh, I, I'll give you a, a brief example, and I, I don't worry about this one being too classified because it's on the Discovery Channel special that they made, uh, where he was actually, I, I was there in Afghanistan in November of 2011. He was there in September of 2011. Uh, now, there were only a few people on the ground in September of 2011, uh, and most of them were not wearing uniforms. Uh, he happened to be one of the ones that was. Um, and he got put into a, a, a very uh, multiple dangerous situations uh, where it would have been very easy for him or any part of his team to shoot up the Red Star Cluster and say, get us out of here. Uh, but they wouldn't give up on the mission. They wouldn't give up on the forces that they were there to support. Uh, they couldn't do that uh, because, as uh, you know, Simon Sinek said earlier today, they wouldn't have given up on them, right? Uh, so that takes a, a certain amount of intestinal fortitude where you know that you're in a bad situation and things are going even worse uh, to stick it out and to do what's right, to be committed to that mission uh, the way that they were. Uh, and, and I wish that you were here to give you the color details, but. I mean, that's a couple of them. Thank you, sir. Yeah, sure. Impromptu, the 
I'm sorry I didn't catch the first part of your uh, piece, but I want to make sure I understood the question you just asked. Um, too often, what I read behind the lines of what you just asked, why do you want to hear how, how you termed it, the bad, you know, crazy story the, the soft guy's out there doing? Too often that tells me that there's a misconception among most people that the soft community, all we do and all we're about is bending and breaking the rules to do whatever it takes to get the mission done. I, am I accurate in that assessment? Who asked the question? I, I would say that answer. Yeah. So I, I know Colonel Tabor would like to talk to that, and I'm going to share a little bit too because I don't want this to go past. I think it's very important, particularly for the young uh, audience, the, the cadets who aspire to come into this community. Colonel Tabor was a lieutenant. I was a captain when we went through PAVE training. We started out together in this, this community in that environment. We both probably had similar kinds of ideas in the back of our head at, at what this community was like. Nothing and I'm telling you, nothing could be farther from the truth. What makes a good special operator is what makes a good officer. It's somebody who knows the instructions, the guidance, the AFIs, the rules better than, the, than anybody else. And I will tell you, I'll pit any of our enlisted members up against anybody across this globe. They understand this mission better than anybody else, and they know what the limitations are. We joke, but we're serious when he says, you'll learn that everything is waverable. You look at the instructions the AFSOC community publishes and follows, and in the back four or five pages, it's a list of waiver authorities. Why do we do that? Because typically, most of the missions we faced and they face today are not covered by the book. They're in an environment that nobody's ever seen before. So how do you handle that? You fall back on the training, the discipline, the guidance, the instructions, the airplane wasn't supposed to go over 50,000 pounds. There's reasons for that, and you had to get a waiver to that point. Why? Because the amount of risk that you're assuming. So the good special operator, the valuable people on our team were the ones that could come to the boss and say, sir, I know we've got to do this mission. These are our limitations. This is the capability we have. Here are the four areas that we're going to need a waiver from, and here are the levels that we need those waivers to be granted in order to conduct this mission. And here's the amount of risk we're gonna to assume to make it happen. Do you understand the difference? A totally different environment if you just say, screw it, 53,000, who cares? Let's just make it happen. Let's just take, you know, make a run faster, hit it harder. Not how it happens, not anywhere close. <laughs> so the environment that he just described had scrutiny you know, sometimes all the way up to the SECDEF level. Why do we do that? The interesting part is that community makes it look easy. And that's the stories you want to hear. What you need to take away from that is you will not find a more dedicated set of professionals and good at what they do than any other community on the globe, I think. And maybe I'm a little partial because we came from that. But I'll let Colonel Tabor talk to that, but I don't want that question to go by without emphasizing yeah, that point. So one of the things that I talk about is uh, that, that we have within DOD at large, uh, but certainly within uh, the Air Force, is a checklist mentality, right? Uh, and there's a reason for that. You know, we're kind of trained by checklists. There's a rote method to getting certain things done, particularly when it comes to flying operations. And that's a great way of standardizing things and of training uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a methodology. Uh, the problem with that comes when you get to the end of the checklist and you still have mission to do. And how do you find somebody who can operate outside of the checklist? Uh, kind of like what uh, Colonel Holland's uh, talking about. You know, where, at what point can you articulate the risk uh, such that you, know, you give your bosses all the data that they need and they get to decide, yep, this is worth doing or it's not. And what I would argue is that that comes down to that maturity uh, piece. You know, how, how do we find somebody who can do things right, you know, by the checklist, but also do the right thing when the checklist no longer applies and you're out there left to execute a mission that otherwise couldn't be done? 
Yeah, that's, what, that's what it means to be a soft airman, to be an air commando. Question? Uh, sir, C3C William Duvall from Cadet Squadron 33. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank you for coming and talking to us. It's a real honor to have you here. Uh, my question is uh, twofold. First, when you went to the Pentagon, I'm sure there was a very drastic difference from how your soft community approaches leadership versus the more staff-oriented that I know the Pentagon has. And I was wondering how you dealt with and adapted to those changes. And the second part of my question is, sir, when you returned to your more people-focused community, what did your experiences change about your leadership style approach when you returned? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. First, you know, what I, would tell, uh, what I would tell you is that leadership is leadership. You know, it's not different in soft than it is on a staff. Uh, you might encounter different uh, strengths of leadership in different places. Uh, but I would tell you that my experience on the air staff was every bit as good as my experience on the SOCOM staff or on the JSOC staff. Everybody is just as committed. Everybody wants to get the mission done. Uh, so it, it wasn't that drastic of a change for me, frankly. Um, I think that to your, your second point, that whenever we get a chance to go into other communities, whether it's me getting to go to the Pentagon uh, or, uh, or other uh, people getting to come into SOF, what you do is you bring that collective experience. And nobody's got it 100% right. But together, we take pieces of the experience and we put them together and we get pretty darn close to 100%. But it's not on one individual. It's by virtue of having that, uh, that broad experience and seeing how pe different people approach it differently. So not, not all that big of a difference, frankly. Thank you, sir. Yep. Sir C1C Caldwell from Cadet Squadron 38. My question is about your community in general. I think one of the things that cadets and probably the American community in general admire about the special operations community is your esprit de corps and the general camaraderie that we see in your units. Um, this morning, Mr. Sinek in his second hour talked about ranger school and how one of the components of ranger school is peer evals. You have to pass your peer evals mm -hmm. in order to um, pass any phase of ranger school. We don't do peer evals at the Air Force Academy. Um, and obviously they're not included in OPRs, as someone talked about. And I think that maybe we're losing a piece of camaraderie that, that would maybe make us better as a whole by not doing that. My question is for you, especially in your position now uh, with a schoolhouse component, do you think there's value in having peer evals? Do you do it? in the schoolhouse, and uh, if not, why not, and do you think we should? Um, good question. So, uh, no, we do not do peer evals, and uh, the reason we don't do that is because it's, uh, it's a training environment where we want people to learn skill sets, and uh, I think that there is a perception that that would detract from it. It would create a sense of, uh, of haves and have-nots. Uh, furthermore, what I would tell you is that I'm, I'm not convinced that that is a critical part of building a team. Uh, I think that it has a purpose, uh, and I think that uh, certainly 360 feedbacks are, are, are very, very good at kind of identifying the things that we are not able to see in ourselves. But what I would tell you is that what really builds teams and what makes the community so special in AFSOC and in SOF in general is that, it, one, it's small. Uh, and, and you tend to know a lot of people, and, and I would tell you that that's probably very much the same kind of environment that you have here at the academy. The second thing is you get kind of trial by fire, you know, and, and the experience that you're going through, particularly uh, the, the freshmen here, you know, that's a bonding experience. I'll tell you that I've had a, a number of bonding experiences on, uh, on deployments uh, in SOF. Uh, one of the best Christmases I ever spent was around a campfire in Jacobabad, Pakistan. Made me so much closer to my community than I ever thought possible. And what, uh, what the chief and I talk about, and, and this happens in, in all the different pockets of SOF, and when I say the pockets, the different weapon systems or the different specialties. What happens is you really, I mean, there's no, no other word for it, but love. You develop a love for your compatriots and a love for the mission. Uh, and I talk about it, uh, Colonel Holland will appreciate this, you know, the, the community of Pavlo uh, folks that I grew up with, I love every one of them like a brother. Even the ones who don't deserve 
too much loving, of which there's more than a handful. But those are people that I know share my values. They're people that have a dedication to the mission. They're people that I have gone through some extraordinarily difficult circumstances with. And that bond can't be broken. And it's strongest for me among, among the Pavelo crews that I grew up with. But it also applies to the larger AFSOC uh, community that, I, that I'm now leading. And I would tell you that it applies just as much to my joint partners that I worked with at JSOC. You know, there are people there that, you know, I know would, uh, would do anything in the world for me, and I certainly would do anything in the world for them. So it's that, that, uh, that concentrated experience that I think builds on that ethos, that, that, uh, that ethic that we have that creates everything that people are envious of. But I think that it exists in other pockets, too. I mean, you're living a part of it right now. I was talking to a cadet last night who said, man, I, I just love the Air Force because I know that there's a half dozen of my buddies that I could call right now who would come and pick me up if I told them that I was in trouble. Yeah, that's what it's about. It's about loving the people that you're with and the mission that you're involved in. And man, we got it in SAW. It's a great place. Thank you, sir. Afternoon, sir. C3C Stephen Fox, also from Fort Bragg in Vietnam. Um, my main question to you is, uh, for the NCLS communication team, what is one thing to, that you want to share to the world that's specific about the Air Force Special Operations com sorry, community? What kind of inspiration do you want to share to the world? So inspiration about the about soft. Well, I, I think the, it, it probably got to it at this uh, last uh, question, and that is the the community that we are, uh, that it is something bigger than the uh, individuals, that uh, by virtue of the circumstances that we're that we're in, by virtue of the uh, the the other people of our joint community that come together, it builds a a, a great environment where people are dedicated to getting the mission done. Uh, there's nothing better than knowing that you're going to succeed because you got a massive team around you that won't let you fail. And that's part of that soft ethos that, that we love. And that, like I said, I think, it, I think it's throughout the Air Force. You just gotta find the pockets of it where it exists. Other questions? And I would add to that, if you can't find the pocket, create it. There's no reason why you can't make that happen right here in your flight, in your element, in your cadet squadron. I know you guys get tired of me saying that, but I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> it, it's who we are. It's the community we've come from, and it can happen right here at the United States Air Force Academy in your cadet squadron. It's up to you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, C1C Hoist from CS16. Uh, my question is pretty kind of simple, but also I think it would be useful for everyone. Uh, Peter Blaber, a Delta Force commander, wrote a book named The Mission, The Men, and Me, and outlines that the mission comes first and then your men. Uh, do you have any experiences from your time in the special operations community where you've had a dilemma between the mission completion and the welfare of your men? If so, how did you handle it? Um, you know, I can't think of anything uh, specific, uh, but I'll, I'll talk in, in general uh, about this idea of is it mission first, people always, or people first, mission always. And you hear that a lot of times. And, and I'll tell you that for a vast majority of my career, I would, you know, no question in my mind, I'd say it's mission first, people always. Because we didn't all come here just to be people. We came here to do a mission, right? But recently, I've been giving it a lot more thought as we, uh, as we see uh, the, the pressures of personnel uh, across the Air Force. I think that we've got to really kind of dedicate ourselves more to taking care of our people and making sure that you know, we're creating an environment that they want to be a part of for the long term. So my thinking's starting to come around uh, on that. Um, 
you know, I've uh, been involved in missions where uh, people came back pretty white knuckled. Uh, people came back saying that they're never going to fly again. And uh, the response to that was, thank you, uh, appreciate what you've done so far, we don't need you anymore. Um, and, and I don't have any heartburn about doing that. Uh, because it is about getting the, the mission done. And if somebody doesn't have the stomach to do it or is fearful of their own capabilities and the, their ability to accomplish it, then we certainly don't need them on the team uh, because we've, we've got to get that mission done. So it is, a, it is a, always a, a tension that exists there between the mission and the people. But like I said, I'm, I'm starting to kind of come around on it that we better start doing a little bit better job of uh, paying attention to uh, the people and making this a place where they want to stay for the long term. Thank you. Other questions? Sir, Matthew Chris from the Department of Economics and Geosciences. Sir, we've seen a, a tremendous evolution of special forces, the Special Operations Doctrine, OSS, Vietnam, Cold War to today, right? The operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. What do you see as the future of special operations in the Air Force in the next 10 to 20 years? And so really, really great question and one that uh, we've been talking about a lot at uh, AFSOC. So it's growth. Uh, this mission is not going away. Uh, we have seen more and more demand on the soft platforms that we have on the battlefield. Uh, whether that's what I would call the traditional soft platforms, and by that I mean AC-130 gunships, uh, MC-130 uh, uh, Hs now converting to Js, uh, or the V-22, or some of the newer ISR platforms that we fly to include unmanned uh, systems. That mission is not going away. It is only going to uh, grow. So uh, we really have a big challenge now. You know, everybody kind of uh, planned on some sort of a peace dividend uh, two or three years ago, we could all kind of take a breath and, and recoup. That has not happened. Uh, it hasn't happened for anybody, but arguably it has grown for us off as we expand our battlefields, both in declared theaters of active armed conflict and outside of those areas. Uh, so I think that it's a, it's a growing mission, and the challenge that we're going to have is, is serving it while we continue to, to serve the people and make them able to do it for the long term. Thanks, sir. Hi, uh, Colonel Tom Drowan, Military and Strategic Studies. Uh, I wanted to put in a plug for the AFSOS, the Air Force Special Ops School. Uh, several of us here have been able to go to dynamics of international terrorism where you get to shoot cool weapons. Uh, some of the regional courses. So mm -hmm. I one of the great roles is educating the general purpose forces about special ops or specialized ops. And then I wanted to push a little bit on that other theme with, with the greater demand on special operations or specialized operations and, and having been exposed to the soft imperatives, because <laughs> everybody gets sort of educated in, in the soft mindset when you attend one of these courses. You know, one is this skepticism that uh, about the ability to grow those specialized capabilities given the force that we have. And then given the threats that we're facing, particularly the hybrid threats, uh, you know, the, it begs the question, how specialized can general purpose forces become compared to how big special operations forces can become? And could you talk a little bit about that? Because that seems to be a real dilemma these days. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. So uh, back uh, when uh, uh, Colonel Holland and I were uh, just learning to fly the MH-53, I don't think anybody else was flying on NVGs at the time, um, outside of uh, special operations. Um, but nowadays, that's that's commonplace. I mean, that's that's a given. That's a part of the the formal training that uh, I think uh, all weapon systems uh, incorporate. Uh, so I would say that a lot of those general purpose forces have adopted uh, that soft mentality. So I think it gets to, all right, what is specialized about soft now? Um, and it's getting much more highly technical. I mean, I think in the, uh, in the cyber arena, that is a, that is a huge growth area. 
uh, and not something that, that we have as a specialty within AFSOC, but certainly that the soft community is looking uh, to exploit in order to uh, gain an advantage on the, uh, the enemy. Uh, so I think that there, there is a lot more of uh, the specialized mission that can go to what has generally been considered the general purpose force. But I can assure you that the special operations force, the, uh, as uh, General Brown, a former uh, uh, commander at SOCOM said, uh, the black is getting blacker and the white is getting grayer. Uh, and that's, I think, the reality of the world that we're in right now. And, and I think, I would argue that that is a good thing. I think that, that the overall level is, uh, is rising to meet that challenge. You're welcome. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Ted Smell from Norwich University. I had a question uh, going back to your leadership. So we talked about mission first people always, and you also talked about now how we're going out of established theaters of conflict. So now when you have detachments and you're spreading your... So, uh, your soft assets over the world, how do you uh, develop and change up your leadership style so you make sure that you are taking care of your people as you are spreading them thinner over the globe? Yeah, so the, uh, the metric that we use is kind of the, the dwell rate. I mean, the idea that you spend more time at home than you do deployed in some area of Africa, for instance. Uh, so, so that's really our, our metric, and trying to drive that higher is always something that we want to do. But there is a constant demand uh, from the geographic combatant commanders to provide more combat capability. So that puts, uh, I think, the, the senior leadership of the command in a tight spot of, okay, well, how much is, is too much more? And what we have to do, what we have done, is, is decide what are our red lines? What are the things that we must do? Uh, and what are the, the things that we're not going to ask our people to go over? A one to two dwell ratio? or a 1 to a 1.5 dwell ratio. That's where we have to uh, draw the line. And uh, if we do decide to go over that, make sure that it's a conscious decision. Uh, because kind of like uh, uh, Colonel Holland talked about, you know, commanders deal in risk. And there's risk in everything that we do. It, and the question comes down to, is the risk worth the potential payoff out there? And in some cases, the answer is, you bet it. You bet there is. But in some cases, you know, when you look at it and you analyze it, you go, you know what, there, there's just not enough bang for the buck, so we're not going to do that. So that is a, that is a constant uh, issue that we deal with. Uh, but there's, there, I don't think is a magic line on the calendar someday where we say, okay, we're, we're over that. This is just going to be a part of the way that we operate in the future, and uh, we're going to have to balance that. And thus my conclusion that we better start thinking a little bit harder about how we make this an environment that people can live in for the long term, or, or else we risk losing the experience that we're building. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I'll, I'll add to the question that uh, Colonel Drillhan uh, asked in terms of the, it, it's a great question, and I think our Air Forces and the soft forces have struggled with it for many, many years, and it's well explained by what's the difference between the black and the white. The white's getting grayer, the black's getting blacker. But another aspect of specialization, uh, in, in my mind, is, is a skill set, a, a capability. It's not that we're special people. The entire force is made up of special people. When you take a set of those and put them aside and create a special capability, it's a perishable skill. And, and I'll give you an example, uh, and I may be dating myself, but Colonel Tabor could relate to it. Now you're dating me. Uh, exactly. <laughs> well, while the techniques, the technology, the tactics will evolve, update, and maintain pace with, with maintaining that specialized capability, uh, you also, as a leader, we have to be careful of, as a, as a force, we have to be careful of making sure we maintain the capability through currency. So. An example, when I was an uh, 05 squadron commander, uh, it's difficult to maintain the skill sets that we had to maintain flying a PAVE. I mean, there was an incredible number of mission sets, uh, being qualified to land on ships, to, you know, lots of different things. And I recall one evening, I, I, as a squadron commander, I, got, I was out flying, uh, didn't get as many hours as I'd like to at that point in time, so your skill sets get a little rusty, and so typically when you do that, you're trying to 
check all the squares. So I, I was completely suited up in a rubber suit with a mask on, forced air into my system. It's called a, there's a fancy term for it, but it's a suit you wear to, to combat the chemical environment. Helmet on, goggles down, difficult enough to see through this already. Two o'clock in the morning, we're practicing an aerial refueling plug-in, so I'm trying to plug into a hose off of a C-130. It's completely pitch black, very little illumination, which you talk about it at nighttime when you're on the goggles, the percent illumination that the moon is providing, it's easier to see the lower the alum is, the harder to see, even with the goggles on. It was barely, you know, 10% that night. It was not a field grade night. Here I am out there flying, trying to get my currency back. And to boot, when it gets that dark out over the horizon, on the, the water, you lose the horizon. You're, there's just nothing but black. And it's raining. <laughs> and I'm plugging into the hose thinking, what in the world am I doing? <laughs> the risk, you, you just start numbering the risk factors and they're going off the charts. Nobody's shooting at us. Nobody's dying. There were no troops in contact. I just need to get my currency back or to maintain it. We make it look easy because we do it all the time. And that's an aspect of special operations that's, that you have to keep in mind from a leadership standpoint is the currency and the, uh, of the crew members to actually perform. Anybody in here could probably do that, but can you do it all the time at the drop of a hat? So that eats into, into this equation of trying to maintain the specialized portion of the force. It's not just about the technology, it's not just, you can't manufacture it overnight, and you got to pay attention to it. Uh, and that problem set hasn't changed any as we evolve. I, you know, I've been out of it a little longer than you have, but I don't know if you have any comments on that piece. Yeah, well, what it brings to mind for me, and, and this is a, a good lesson that I learned uh, in the early days of uh, OEF, and, uh, and, and that's exactly that the, the training pays off. Um, because whether it's the, uh, the mission that we did with the uh, Suburban in the back of the, uh, the, the uh, pave lobe, or uh, when we got shot up going into an infill uh, in a KAUST, or when our automatic uh, flight controls uh, went bad on us and we still had uh, an air refueling and an infill under fire to do. The only reason that we were able to do that is because of the training that we had put in, the hours and hours and years that we had dedicated to doing that. And it came to us just like that. And they were high-risk missions. They were high-risk missions, but the mitigation was all that preparation that we had done for it. And I'm proud to say we didn't lose a, a single aircraft uh, during that uh, engagement. Uh, so that, that, that's a big takeaway that I, I would give you, is that you know, training, it might seem inane and boring and not worth your time, but when it counts, it'll be there, and, and I'm here to testify that to you. Other questions? Sir, C2C Thatcher from CS15. You mentioned commitment and the importance that plays in the uh, special operations community. And I just had a question, you know, as, here as leaders, um, I think everyone here knows a cadet who's super committed and we all probably know some cadets who aren't as committed um, to what we're doing here. In the special operations community, community, how do you deal with those who may not be as committed to the mission um, as is required? Well, I would tell you that there's a, a, a pecking order develops uh, pretty rapidly. And uh, for those people who uh, don't have that level of commitment that's necessary, they don't get put into the units that are doing the missions that are most important. Uh, they will get siphoned off into uh, staff and support missions uh, and then eventually find their way out of, uh, out of AFSOC. Um, now, hopefully it doesn't get to that point. Hopefully you know, the team can rally around them and can drive their level of commitment up. Uh, but there are certainly cases where people don't get it. Uh, and that's fine. It's, it is not a world for everybody. The Air Force is not for everybody, right? Uh, but we try to make it for them. And if it, they don't, then, you know, they can't be a part of that uh, team. 
I mean, it is the, when I, I tell you about our joint partners and the missions that uh, they do, they rely on our specialized air support to facilitate their success. And the going in proposition is that this is going to be 100% successful from the get-go. There's not even any question about failing. Uh, now, that is an unrealistic expe expectation. Nobody succeeds 100% of the time. But the expectation going into that mission is you will succeed. Thank you, sir. OK. Unless there's any other questions, I want to thank you all for, uh, for your questions and for your time. It really is an honor to be here uh, today. I, I hope that I've shed some light on, uh, on uh, AFSOC to you, how important it is to develop leaders deliberately, and uh, what it's like to be an air commando. Thank you all very much. Have a great day.